There's something that Mike DeFrank says that I really like. Good morning, church. We're glad that you're here with us, physically present, and we're also glad that anybody that's joining us on the uh, live stream, that would be welcome to you too. Um, in your bulletin, there's a sheet that you should sign up. If you haven't already filled that out, uh, you can leave that in the basket in the narthex. Uh, if you have a cell phone, you might want to turn it off or silence it or put it in airplane mode or maybe even throw it away. I don't know. Um, um, but if you would please uh, stand for the call to worship. Let us sing to the Lord our God. Majestic holiness. Awesome in glory. Glory For God is highly exalted. Please bow for the invocation. Lord of life, we gather as your people to give you glory and to receive your goodness into our lives. Lend flavor to our lives that we, that we may be salt to the earth. Light us with the fire of your spirit that we may shine as lights of prophetic truth. Fill us this hour for usefulness in your world that our words and deeds may add to your praise. Amen. Please remain standing for the hymn of praise, all creatures of our God and King, number 22 in the hymnal or in the bulletin, verses 1 and 4. Christ came to bring us salvation and righteousness and joy. Yet we live in a time when many people feel unhappy and dissatisfied, even many who know of Christ. We do well to seek a restoration of Christian joy for our friends and our neighbors and for all those vexed by unhappiness and dissatisfaction. Let us do so in a minute of silent prayer together and then I'll bring us together in a spoken prayer.
how fortunate we are to have a relationship with you. You've gone to such trouble to make sure that we in particular have this relationship. Your gifts of Christ and his call upon our lives bring us happiness and joy. Thank you. We want to praise your name today. Take away from us all that distracts us from focusing on you. May our praise be pure. Let our joy be real. Even so, Lord, these times prove difficult for many of us. We American people stand so divided and have such trouble finding the middle ground. So much anger flies back and forth. What seems like a wonderful blessing to some seems like a terrible setback to others. Grant that we as a nation might turn back to you in real life-changing commitment. Begin with us. Teach us to model lives guided by love and faithfulness, community and joy. Teach us to show the world the community that we have in you. May the world see our joy in you and want to have it. Your church stands out of practice on truly evangelizing our neighbors. We are surrounded by a big community of people who can be blessed by your community and joy. From those who live around us, to the soldiers at Fort Bliss and their families, to the students at UTEP, show us how to reach these folks, to show them what they are missing. Help us to lead them to celebrate joy in you. We would put away whatever anger dwells in our own hearts, whatever divisiveness. We want to do so to your glory and honor. Help us to sing to you a new song of praise today. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Let us stand for our reading from God's word. It's from the 98th Psalm, the first through the ninth verses. O sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, our Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and all who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Why do we sing in worship? In some congregations, only the worship team sings, putting on a show for the congregation. In other congregations, the people sing, but they only sing the same few favorite songs over and over and over again. The psalmist, however, urges us to sing a new song, The answer for why we would want to sing a new song comes from our psalm. We sing because the Lord has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. When this psalm was first written, God's people could point to several dramatic acts of God in history the miraculously successful exodus from Egypt and the unusual spectacular return of the Jewish people from the exile in Babylon. These made up two of their greatest salvation stories. Ancient Jews certainly sang songs celebrating these two salvation events. However, all through this history, one finds woven the hope and the promise of a savior, a Christ. As the people dreamed of the one to bring full salvation, they developed all sorts of fantasies of what the Christ would do when he came. The popular expectation got much of it wrong. In fact, the people rejected the Christ because he did not conform to their fantasies of military conquest. Even so, God used the people's rejection of Christ to work through Christ a broader, grander salvation than what the people had expected. First, Christ brought us the ways of God's righteousness. That is to say, Christ taught us an ethics and a morality far greater than any other teacher ever taught. Repeatedly, he said, you have heard that it was said to you thus and so, but I say to you, do this and that. He spoke of turning the other cheek, of going the extra mile, of giving without expecting anything in return. Basically, he taught us how to make peace and create wholeness to live in righteousness and in love, to go against fallen human nature, to rise to the ethics of a people of God. These ethics have transformed life in the part of the world once known as Christendom. The values of Christ have soaked so deeply into Western culture that some have mistakenly thought them to be instinctive or innate. Our nation's founders famously found these truths to be self-evident 
that would undergird democracy and justice and freedom. Yet they've only proven self-evident in cultures influenced by Christ. Even in countries that have sadly walked away from Christ, the principles of Christ's righteousness still operate. This righteousness makes democracy, freedom, and justice possible. Yet God knew fallen human nature would keep us from living the ideal ethics of Christ, even though we believe in them. Therefore, God prepared a way to save us from fallenness, to save us from sin, to restore us to a close relationship with our righteous God. God's plan involving have involved having Christ come and live the purely ethical life for us. To make it the ultimate expression of that pure ethics, God brought Christ face to face with the worst opposition the world has to offer. By remaining faithfully ethical, even to the point of being crucified, Christ lived the ultimate human life, the life fully reconciled to God. Now God grants us reconciliation with God and total salvation if we identify with Christ, if we faithfully aspire to grow into Christ's likeness. God makes it so that we who do so have more abundant spiritual lives even if we run into some of the material opposition that Christ ran into. Moreover, God makes it where if we keep after such an aspiration, however imperfectly, to the end of our lives, we will be restored eternally to unity with God. Many people think Christ only offers eternal life after death, but Christ offers abundant life now that extends into eternity. Charles Gabriel worked in the great revival movements of the early 20th century. His calling involved producing what were then new songs to celebrate and praise God's gifts through Christ. One of those songs goes, in loving kindness Jesus came, my soul in mercy to reclaim. And from the depths of sin and shame, through grace he lifted me. From sinking sand he lifted me. With tender hand he lifted me. From shades of night to plains of light, oh praise his name, he lifted me. Thus we have in Charles Gabriel's own words why he sings a new song a new song at the time. Yet we've only begun to explore the psalmist's reasons for singing a new song to God. He also speaks of the Lord's steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. We tend to forget what a tiny, insignificant nation Israel would be if it had not been chosen by God. Jewish people make up one-fifth of one percent of the world's population. Even so, God made a commitment to them when their numbers were even smaller. They gave the Lord many opportunities to turn away. In the Old Testament, we find examples of apostasy after apostasy. Just in the book of Judges, we find multiple ones. And then you have the whole period of the kings and the prophets. No person would have stayed as steadfast in loving a group of people. No person would have proved as faithful to a commitment to a group of people. Yet the Lord says, I am God and not a person. His steadfast love and faithfulness to Israel did not waver. God announced and demonstrated that steadfast love and faithfulness from a cross on a hill in obscure Judea. From the cross in the throes of agony, Jesus spoke words of forgiveness 
and love and faith. That gift would have been impressive enough of a sign of God's love and faithfulness. Yet God's love and faithfulness embraces not just Israel, but all the ends of the earth. From what appeared to be a ruinous start, the ministry of Jesus Christ has disseminated to Africa, Europe, North America, South America, and parts of Asia. In spite of running into all sorts of trouble, God has steadfastly worked to get the good news of God's love and faithfulness through Christ to all the world. Even so, God's love and faithfulness have not stopped there. As I've mentioned earlier, Europe and America have been wandering away from Christ. So God has been sending missionaries here from Asia and Africa to save the lost Americans. We were not evangelizing as we might have been, so God in love and faithfulness sent others who would do it for us. He did so that we might be jolted into singing songs of evangelistic praise ourselves. If God's steadfast love and faithfulness stopped there, it would merit powerful new songs of praise. However, it does not stop there. God's steadfast love and faithfulness has been extended to each one of us. Like the nation of Israel, each of us individually has given God many opportunities to give up on us. Sometimes we have deliberately gone against God's will for our lives. Other times we have found ourselves stuck in sinful ways without being sure how to get out. And then there have been times that we have unknowingly failed to follow Christ. Nonetheless, God's steadfast love and faithfulness to each one of us has not been turned away. Here we sit, unusual among our countrymen, committed to God and Christ, to church and Christian ethics, and to singing God's praise. A group of contemporary Christian musicians called Third Day dwelt upon all we've been considering, and they wrote a new song, singing praise to God for God's love and faithfulness. It goes, your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your justice flows like the ocean tide. I will lift my voice to worship you, my king. I will find my strength in the shadow of your wings. We have double reason now to sing a new song. Even so, we've not exhausted the reasons the psalmist gives us for singing a new song. We've only considered the things that God has already done. In verses 7 through 9, the psalmist exults in God's promises. The psalmist speaks of the earth rejoicing, even nature itself, because God comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. God will bring into existence a new heaven and a new earth. In this new earth, the cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den and the young child will put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all God's holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Anticipation of that day brings such joy that the earth fairly rejoices along with us. The earth that will be cared for and loved and free from conflict. Let us here in the roar of the sea, the sea's gratitude for what is coming. As the rivers splash over the rocks, let us hear that as their applause 
to God. The hills and the mountains, as they green up with the monsoon rains, seem to sing for joy as they thrust their rocky hands into the atmosphere. In this beautiful world will dwell our redeemed selves, our redeemed families, our ancestors, and our descendants. No longer will mothers cry for their lost children because some deranged maniac has attacked them. No longer will diseases and pathogens force people into lockdowns and isolation. Indeed, humankind will cease to exploit the earth wastefully. Everyone will act in loving righteousness, and there will be enough for all to have joy. What governance the world still requires at that time will be provided by Christ, who will have returned to earth and filled it with God's glory. We will be governed by God's righteousness and by God's steadfast love. Christ will be known as King of kings and Lord of lords. When we think of all the unpleasantness in our political process, when we think of the anti-Christian tyrants who are plaguing the world, the thought of the Lamb of Calvary on the throne sounds worthy of the throaty singing of a new song. In 1975, Steffi Geyser Rubin was reading some of Isaiah's prophecies. She was moved to sing a new song. It has rhythm and melody like to a Jewish dance music, but it represents an entirely new composition. It goes, you shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountain and the hills will break forth before you and all the trees of the field will clap, will clap their hands while you go out with joy. Given these three fantastic reasons for singing God's praises, the psalmist instructs us to sing a new song and to accompany it with all sorts of instruments. Lest anyone panic, I'm not advocating we adopt any new instrumentation. The chimes, organ, piano, and bells are fine. For us, they fill the role of the lyre, the trumpet, and the horn in ancient Jewish worship. Nonetheless, the raucous worship prescribed by the psalm stands striking. I grew up in a church so formal that one Sunday a man shouted amen, and the whole church just stopped in place. On another occasion, the choir, which normally sang operatic numbers, sang a calypso piece for Christmas, and the entire congregation was reduced to apoplexy. Their accustomed, very formal worship was fine for the small fraction of the world that responds to such things. In comparison, the psalm calls for a raucous celebration for bringing in all the people and all the styles. Unbridled joy, happiness before the Lord. If our songs are so heavy that we can't sing more than two verses, maybe we need some new, lighter music. Worship committee and wrath builders are advocating that we add one song, not a praise band, not a praise set, one praise song. Nothing's being replaced, nothing is being removed, just a new song is being added. If we're going to follow the psalmist's call to raucous joy, that seems like a sure enough step to take. We've been tinkering with the opening of the worship in response to a survey about where people felt closest to God in our worship, the part of the worship where they felt the least close to God was the beginning. And the problem with that is that most people who are visiting your church decide whether they're coming back or not during the beginning of the service. So we've been tinkering with that a little bit. But let me say I love the old hymns. 
and I have no plans to replace or displace them. It's just they're not the only hymns that we can sing, and they don't meet everyone's expression of joy. Remember that most of the old hymns are not particularly that old. Christ Church is 20 centuries old, and what we consider the good old hymns are about one century old. They were written for the Brush Arbor revivals that were popular a century ago. Interestingly, in that time, they were performed. There was a soloist who sang the verses, and the congregation only contributed the choruses. That's why they have verses and choruses. Most of the history of the church preceded those Brush Arbor revivals, and it continues on past them. In reality, our experience of our many blessings from God is forever new. We change, the world changes, our perspective on the divine revelation changes. The book of, Revela of Lamentations says, his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Interestingly, those words about everything being new were turned into one of the old hymns, Great is Thy Faithfulness. One Sunday at my college church, a soloist sang a new song. I don't remember very much of it, and I won't sing it for you, but it started off, I will sing to the Lord a new song, Lodi o, Lodi o, and kind of went on from there. The style of the hymn was fairly traditional for choir music. In any case, my buddy and I were walking out of the church, and my buddy said, Did you like that solo? I didn't like it at all. I responded, He wasn't singing for me or you. He was singing to God and for God. So it doesn't matter whether I liked it or not. It matters whether God liked it or not. That's the attitude I try to take on all church music. If it expresses the heart of joy to God, then God bless it. If a song does that for someone present in the congregation, then let us accompany them in joy. After all, the psalm says to make a joyful noise. It says to do so in response to God's salvation and righteousness, to God's steadfast love and faithfulness, to the promise of the new heaven and the new earth. Let us then be joyful. Let us sing whatever helps any of us make a joyful noise before the Lord. And let the glory be God's through Jesus Christ. Amen. If you've not started singing a new song for the Lord with your life, the time has come to do so. If you do not have a church family with whom to sing the new song, the time has come to join this one. Simply stand where you are and move toward the aisle. An elder will join you and we will receive you into the chorus of God. Let us stand and sing our invitation hymn, How Great Thou Art, number 33, verses 1 and 4.
Lee Strobel, in his book, A Case for Miracles, has documented many instances of miraculous healing. We know that as much reigns possible any time we take the sick before God in prayer. Even if God does not grant a miracle, God will grant help and strength. Thus, we pray for help and healing in every service. Today, we pray for Aaron Perez, for Bruce Porter, for Chris, Kim, and Connor Baxter, for Jenny Rutherford, for Dylan Blystone, for Gary and Helen Byers, for Amber Lopez, for all those who are traveling the roads, and for our first responders. Let us join in prayer together. O oh God, we call on your name in behalf of these loved ones who struggle. Only your helping, healing ministry can sustain their hope and recoveries. Be with those we've named aloud and with those whose names have been printed in our bulletins. Bring them hope and healing and wholeness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Instead of teaching us how to do more time management, the Bible calls each of us to do less and consequently to receive peace and rest with God. Time stewardship. Reversing time warped living is about restoring our relationship with the time giver. By doing less, we can have more of God. Those words are from Steve Ganger in Time Warped, First Century Time Stewardship for 21st Century Living. We encourage you to consider leaving a monetary gift in the tithes box in the narthex, pressing the give button on the web page, or sending a check to the church office. At this time, we'll remain seated for our communion hymn number 404, verses 1 and 2. supper stands open to all who profess faith in Christ, let us confess our common faith together. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and my Savior. In one congregation, a woman complained because we were singing joyful music at the communion time. She felt sure that the communion meal should be somber and full of foreboding. However, Jesus is not offering us something here to make us somber and grief-ridden. He offers us the very emblems of his life with us and his love poured out for us. We do well to praise Christ and praise God for the privilege that is ours at the communion table. Let us be in a spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving as we remember that on the night when he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In a like manner after dinner, he took the cup. And when he had blessed it, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this so often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Guide us by your spirit, dear God, that we might know your 
your will for us. Teach us that we might learn from you. Open our hearts that we might receive your love. We gather at the table to remember your great works and especially to remember the Christ whom you sent. Our hearts are filled with awe and wonder when we eat this bread, remembering that Christ gave his life for us. Though Christ, through Christ, you have redeemed us and called us to be your people. Help us to respond to your call and live as faithful disciples. Amen. Gracious Lord, we just come to this table today. Thank you for the day that you've given us. We thank you for the forgiveness. We lift this cup, Lord, as a reminder that you covered our sins on the cross. Father, I just ask that you forgive any of our sins this day, that we may have displeased you. We'll give you an honor and praise today for the sacrifice that you've given us through your Son, the Christ. These things I pray in his name. Let us partake of the Lord's Supper. asked to make three quick announcements. One is don't forget to sign up for CAPERS, which is going to be on July the 7th. Also, um, if you haven't sent in a card for Hazel yet, Sandra has some extra cards. You can see her after the service, and she can help you with that. And there's a cabinet meeting after church today in the, in the meeting room. Let us stand. At, no, we don't stand. Let us sit and sing our hymn of sending, Go in Peace. sing a new song of fervent joy in the way you live out your life this week. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. 